it is my great privilege to have been invited by the Egyptian IVF Center and I'm grateful for the sponsorship by IPSA. And today is a very important topic that we are going to discuss because progesterone is a very important hormone and it is indicated by the title that addresses progesterone from the beginning till the end as far as reproduction is concerned. And the story does not end there because there is even the post-reproductive area, progesterone will also play an important part. However, we have enough on our plate today and the outline for my part of the talk, and then uh, Professor Mona Bulgar will complete the side related to obstetrics, is a brief background to set the scene and then talk about progesterone elevation on day of HCG uh, trigger, which is creating a lot of controversy. And I hope I will persuade you that this controversy has gone for far too long. Then talk about progesterone use in luteal support in ART, which thankfully has less controversy than the first side of the talk. And then talk about progesterone use in recurrent miscarriage, which has some apparent contradiction, but I hope that I will reconcile this contradiction and make them sit into place by the end of this talk. Let's start with the first part of my talk, progesterone elevation in late follicular phase in ovarian stimulation for IVF XC. Is it is associated with poor outcome? And I'm sure some of the audience will already have made up their impression with yes or no. And I am also sure that there will be split of opinion, if not in this audience, in the general audience of assisted reproduction. Some will say it is of no harmful effect and others will say no, no, no. The literature say, or some of the literature say it is, and then we have a mix. Um, and as we read closely the literature, we could really uh, move from that state of uh, yes, uh, uh, and to the ambivalent state of maybe, and hopefully I'll persuade you to see that it is probably uh, um, we are getting the wrong end of the stick and we could stand to do more harm than good if we subscribe to this. The young uh, audience will not appreciate how old this debate is. They think probably we're talking about something that is three or four years old. This debate has been going on for 30 years. And although it is always healthy to debate a question without settling it, then to settle a question without debating it. So debate is great, but surely it must have an end and we must differentiate between our debates in life and debates in medicine. We all have our indulgence sometimes when we indulge into debating, whether it is Messi or Ronaldo, who is the most gifted, the most um, talented, the most entertaining, etc. Fine, we are all having fun and no harm is done. But when it comes to debating something that affects our practice, there will be consequences. And whenever you read an article, I just picked one that happened to be written by Sandro Stevens and some Indian colleagues. And I highlighted the word association between progesterone elevation on the day of HCG and pregnancy outcome after fresh embryo transfer in IVF XC cycles. Why do I highlight the word association? One, to focus our mind that association does not necessarily mean causation. The fact that it's, uh, progesterone is elevated in that particular snapshot measurement does not incriminate this observation onto the uh, adverse outcome, even if there was an adverse outcome. And there are lots of examples in our life when people can make something that's outrageous in terms of association. Let me start by this entertaining one. There is an assertion that thinking too much can make you fat. It's enough for you to look at Professor Abulgar, who does not stop thinking, but you have never seen him any ounce heavier than he should. The same applies to Professor Abusurur and to all the great thinkers that we have. They are not necessarily fat. So people can make all kinds of assertion without necessarily ringing true. 
And correlation is not a causation. And I give you another example. It is hot weather, and some of you will be in the North Coast, etc. Here, there is great correlation between ice cream sales and shark attack. And it is the link. What is the link between ice cream and shark? It is when the weather is not a, a, is hot and sunny, people will go to the beach and will go to, to, to buy ice cream. So the correlation is coming from this without necessarily having any relation that sharks will be attracted by ice cream in the, on the beach. There is a whole website really and, and even a magazine for the funny and the unreasonable correlations. And I pick just one here. There is that beautiful line where it is almost going together, hand in hand. The correlation between United States spending on science, space, and technology correlates with suicide by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. And that correlation is so high. I am sure you would agree with me that this is just a coincidence and there is absolutely nothing concrete to correlate or to link the two. And I would be grateful if you keep hold of these thoughts when we talk about high or elevated progesterone level and the outcome. There are a few questions that we should start by asking them. About elevated serum progesterone on the day of HCG, is it good? Is it bad? Is it neutral? And what is, what level can we consider abnormal? Because the literature also will be having a lot of variability when it comes to whatever level is being suggested. How reliable is the assay? And that is important point. In actual fact, one of the crucial points that people need to take, uh, 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 to pay some attention to is this point. And what causes rise in progesterone? Is it something that is pathological? Is it part of its exercise? Its effect is lasting or temporary? These are the things that we need to take care of. And what is the potential effect of the rise and how frequent is um, uh, the, or the incidence of elevated progesterone on the day of HCG? I mentioned earlier that the debate is 30 year old and for 30 years our scientific community has been in this agreement. I picked one of the papers in 1990 in fertility sterility talking about progesterone levels on day of HCG with gonadotrophin releasing hormone agonist suppression and categorically saying it's not predictive pregnancy outcome. If you were on the side of no harm you would think that our older colleagues have got it right and their science was accurate and their knowledge was sound that they could not fall into the trap of correlation. This paper was seen, uh, the senior author was Sohel Marsher, who is well known in our field. And here, if you can read, on the day of HCG, 72 patients had progesterone under the nine, nine nanogram per mil was the cutoff point. 29 had uh, um, lower than this. Patient with high progesterone group had significantly greater estradiol level on the day of SCG. No significant difference in the clinical pregnancy rate or ongoing pregnancy rate between the two groups. And they concluded early on that in IVF cycles, pre-treated with GNRH agonists, on the day, the progesterone elevation on the day of HCG were not predictive of conceiving in that cycle. A year later, Bell Schoolcraft and others provided a paper that A, moved the goalpost, and they made the cutoff point as 0.5 nanogram per mil. And this group of investigators suggested if progesterone on the day of HCG was higher than 0.5 nanogram per mil, it was associated with significantly lower rates of pregnancy. 12 out of 59, which is effectively 20%, compared when it was lower than 0.5 nanogram of 40 over 74, which is 54%. So the debate started so early and in the same country effectively and with people probably who know each other. 
few years later, another paper in fertility sterility suggested that elevated serum progesterone level on the day of human chorionic gonadotrophin don't predict outcome in assisted reproduction. And you will be surprised that people who champion the cause of elevated progesterone may not be aware of this literature in this day and age. I was giving a talk in Copenhagen a few months back, and when I mentioned some of these papers, one of the authorities involved with this said, I didn't know this paper, can you please send it to me? So we do not always go back to the origin. So the conclusion of that paper in 1994, serum progesterone levels before HCG administration do not predict the outcome of ART cycle. So the conclusion from this paper is exactly that. They may have lower fertilization, even at attached fertilization rate to high progesterone, but it did not have an effect on the uh, clinical outcome because we find it hard not to find something to clutch to. Moving and fast forwarding to 2007, when a group of Greek investigators asked that very same question. And they went further by doing systematic review and meta-analysis. I don't want to sound personal, but every time I see systematic review and meta-analysis, I feel itching because it, is, it has become really so much abused by fitting in a lot of garbage and making assumption about the quality of data and ending up sometimes more misleading than helpful. And from that systematic review and meta-analysis, it was clear that, you know, you can see the line is on the middle line, but if you look even closer, we're talking about comparison of nine pregnancies from 29 patients, uh, again, it's 21 from 72. Uh, zero from 14 as 17 from 99. It is really not huge number for this kind of studies. In 2010, Ernesto Bosch from, the, um, from Spain and his colleagues, including his wife, I think the second author, have published this paper. And they look retrospectively at more than 4,000 IVF cycle, they did not have inclusion or exclusion, and 6% had that higher level than 1.5 nanogram per mil. And the conclusion, a strong negative association, and again, I, I highlight the word association, between pregnancy rate and late follicular phase progesterone irrespective of stimulation, agonist or antagonist. And hence came that magic figure of 1.5. Three years later, the Greek group, that's Venetius and Kilobenakis, Basil Terlatsis and others, they did systematic review that they did one better because the previous one was uh, uh, 3,000 or 6,000. This is 60,000 cycle. And they said, based on the analysis of more than 60,000 cycle, it can be supported that progesterone elevation on the day of HCG is associated with decreased probability of pregnancy. So numbers will, you know, uh, make us frightened. Here is in 2014, which is not long after, people try to look deeper because it is not really um, uh, becoming a consistent observation. The same group, including Ernesto Bosch, who is the advocate of this and other uh, colleagues from Spain, they looked at 3000 cycle in and they suggested that high progesterone level correlated significantly with high estradiol level and in high responder women, progesterone level do not show a significant clinical impact on the result. So we are making some progress. We are separating out patient according to their prognosis and the high prognosis and the good prognosis, the high responder and the good prognosis patient appear to have been given a clean bill of health their corona test is negative. So later, two years later, the Greek group, now we have settled the Spanish and they have moved on to suggest that the good responder or the high responder are clear. The Greek group, they did the analysis and they apply by variate model pregnancy, no pregnancy, there was no effect of progesterone rise. And when they did multivariate model with number of eggs as confounder, 
they, they, they found no linear effect of progesterone rise was seen on the live births. Only few oocytes that they could find that they have an effect. So you would think that the figure of 5% was used earlier, but in the early studies that I referred to 90, uh, uh, from the early 90s onward, when you take 0.9 as the cutoff point, those who said it has no effect, they suggested it is 50% of patients will have more than 0.9. And those who suggested that it has a bad effect, they had an incidence of 19.9. So the confusion is continuing. If you wanted to see the studies of those who said it has no effect, it is inclusive of Sohail Moashar here. It's included of um, Maria Bastillo and um, Caroline Colum. Uh, Mustafa Abu Zaid, uh, Richard Scott, and others saying no effect. Here, David Meldrum, Renato Fanchain, other people, and, and the same group from um, uh, um, Greece. If you are not confused by this stage, you are not paying attention. Another study here from George Grisinger including about 1,800 women observed the incidence of progesterone elevation to be 5% in low responder, 19% in high responder. Overall, the ongoing pregnancy rate was significantly lower in women with elevated progesterone. However, ongoing pregnancy rate were not impaired in high responder with progesterone elevation and were significantly higher compared with normal responder with uh, progesterone elevation. So it means again confirming that with high responder we should not get excited about progesterone. And they provided the graph to show it. Here is the high responder, here is the progesterone elevation, and they are doing even better than the progesterone that is um, uh, uh, at the same level. But what does it make sense that with patients here who have 14 to 18 or 10 to 13, the patient with lower progesterone are doing better. But if you go by the, the, the uh, here is the difference is not as bad as the difference of lower eggs. So the, the lower the eggs, the more pronounced the effect. But what happened to the patient who are very poor responder here? One to five eggs, the impact compared with the uh, patient who have low progesterone is less pronounced than six to nine. And all of those discrepancies will point to something that I hope I will clarify with you, which is coming so soon. Look at the inter, the significant intra-assay of measuring serum progesterone. And to put it in absolute frank terms, if you measure progesterone for the patient at eight o'clock in the morning, it will be different or could be different from the measurement at 12 o'clock. It could be totally different from measuring at 4 p.m. It could be different from measuring at um, 8 p.m. And you can see the point difference. It could be categorizing a patient from high progesterone to normal progesterone for the second measurement. So that inter-assay variation, inter variation is a significant misleading factor in categorizing patient wrongly. If you speak to biochemists and people who know a thing or two about progesterone assay, they will tell you at a level of 1.5 nanogram per mil, the coefficient of variation of the test is huge. It makes it totally and utterly unreliable, but the world and his wife are still measuring progesterone. I'll give you a clear example here. Here is a patient. It was measured in the morning. It categorized her on the high level of um, progesterone. But later in the day, all the measurements are normal and she is fitting into normal category. The same here, it is normal, here it's become high. Here it is high, later normal, later normal, and then it is high. Is this really a test that we can make decisions on? Because remember, it is all about the consequences. We make, what consequence we make? We make a consequence by freezing the embryos and not putting them fresh. 
At this point, I would ask, is there any randomized control trial dividing patient with high progesterone to freeze or transfer fresh and demonstrating that when you freeze and put them in frozen embryo transfer, the results are better? Absolutely not. But we just made ourselves comfortable with going with the deduction that if it is bad, then just put it aside and put it later, then you will get better based on biological plausibility. And biological plausibility is never a substitute for strong clinical evidence. A single progesterone determination on the day of SCG is not reliable enough to make clinical decision due to the enormous variation in progesterone during the day. Uh, Barbara Lawrence and uh, Human Fatimi, they did a study on the impact of gonadotrophin type and you can't really read in, anything into it that separate the different preparation that we use. But what they have highlighted in another study, the same group, exactly what I mentioned earlier from another study. If you measure it at 8 a.m., at 11 a.m., at 2 p.m., at 5 p.m., and it is clear the variation was huge. And because of this, depending on the time of the day when you collect your blood, peel and progesterone levels on the day of SCG declined significantly from the morning to the afternoon in patients questioning the reliability of one progesterone level regarding fresh ET or two embryo freezing. Declining progesterone levels 12 hours after the last FSH or HMG, whatever you are using, suggests that there is that the enhanced ovarian stimulation at the end of the follicular phase will overload the capacity of the enzyme to metabolize progesterone, resulting in its elevated level. But if you just wait 12 hours without giving medication, probably that level will be evening out and you don't have to wait. Just measure the progesterone later in the day. You'll find it is different. So if we want to fit this puzzle together with our or the approach of some of our colleagues, let me declare at this point in time, we don't measure progesterone level. We don't find good biomedical or clinical or evidence-based reason to freeze for those patients if we measure that it was high. And if you look at the freeze all policy, you will find that for the, the policy is very good for the high responder. The very group of patients who've been given a clean bill of health when it comes to elevation of progesterone. Freeze all policy is not good for patients with poor ovarian reserve. And actual fact, it's detrimental. Are we adding insult to injury for this group by freezing their embryos when we know that freezing does not do very well? So what solution do we have? When you look at SAR data, this is what confirmed when you do freeze all for medium or low number of eggs, the outcome is not as good as fresh, regardless of whatever their biochemical profile. And here in graphic term, with the high responder, when you freeze all, you might get similar result, maybe a little bit marginally more, that can be discussed later. When it's normal, it's comparable, but when it is poor response, that fresh will always be better than the frozen. So, it seems that progesterone rise after trigger is probably the problem in low responder. We need to be aware of the circadian variation in progesterone on the trigger day. And a low responder with few oocytes retrieved, it is not a good idea to consider freeze all because freeze all studies suggest that they don't do very well. And this practice of freezing in this group of patients is questionable. And there are people who try to engage into assessing how the literature is divided. Look on that side, no effect on pregnancy rate. On this side, they have negative effect on pregnancy rate. And the circadian that I discussed with you, that um, uh, Live uh, Bangam from Denmark gave me that slide, that is his own work, his own result, showing that bit of variation that and the same here. So high ovarian response does not jeopardize the outcome and it's been demonstrated time and time again. And here there is the 
estradiol and progesterone level during late follicular phase on the outcome of GnRH antagonist cycle. And you can see here that whatever level you have, here you have up to 0.57, up to 0.81, up to 1, up to 1.1. If you look at the result, the clinical pregnancy, 44, 41, 42, 36, none of this, maybe the, last, the latter one that's making significant, but we know that it could be due to other reason rather than the progesterone, because the implantation rate here is 22, 16, 17, or um, 18, here 14. It's hardly a clinical issue, particularly considering the number of studies. So at the end of this part of the talk, do we know what we are doing? If we don't have a clear cutoff, other than that magical point, 1.5, that is used by some, while other they could reduce or move the goalpost to under 0.5. When we don't have an effective intervention, because I demonstrated to you that freeze all for some of the patients who stand to get the harm most, if that is true, is not helpful. Our actions are only reaction the outcome of which is uncertain. We don't have randomized control trial validating our approach to freezing for these patients. But unfortunately, we, some of us love to do blood tests that are variable and are reliable because we are used to, that, to, to do that, or some of us are used to do that. And I'm told the worst sentence in the English language is, we have always done it this way. And the same probably in Arabic. So it is important to review what we do sometimes in the basis of the evidence. We don't validate our data. Sometimes we only validate our prejudice. If we are keen on having blood tests after blood tests, sometimes without asking what is the implication, we do it as a matter of routine. So given the limitation of the currently available assay to measure progesterone at low ranges, caution should be applied to adopt specific cutoff values above which the effect of progesterone rise could be considered detrimental and to recommend freeze all based solely in predefined cutoff points. We don't have that. So moving swiftly on to another contact we have with progesterone, which is using it in luteal phase support, which there is no doubt it is essential after ovarian stimulation. And why it is essential? Because in normal conception, you will have estrogen, the predominant hormone in the follicular phase from the growing follicles. You will have the, um, uh, the um, um, ovulation that follows LH surge, and there is a tiny bit of FSH surge as well here. And then you will have estrogen not going up a bit and then slightly going down, but not significantly so. And then you have progesterone developing from the corpus luteum. So it's all intelligent design, fit for purpose. It is there to prepare the endometrium to be receptive and to be welcoming and to be warm to receive the ensuing embryo. And that is the natural conception story. Estrogen then overlap with a bit of progesterone. People don't appreciate that progesterone start to be detectable before the LH surge. And of course, it is before ovulation. There is some progesterone that come from the granulosa cells in the latter part of the follicular phase and from the theca cell in the earlier part of the follicular phase because under the growth of the follicles, the granulosa, granulosa cell in the latter half of the cycle will be producing some receptors for LH and that LH receptor that will lead to production of some progesterone that is detectable in circulation before LH and before the, in, 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 in years gone by, it used to be considered this bit of progesterone is important for the LH cell to follow. It is part of the positive feedback that we know about. And without progesterone, the essential components of what happens with implantation of a position and adhesions will not happen because the endometrium will not have what it takes to establish a dialogue with the um, embryo. So the growing follicle will produce estrogen 
and start to produce some progesterone late in the follicular phase, LH surge develop, final maturation of the egg occur, and then we have a metaphase two egg. And after the corpus luteum, there will be estrogen, but more importantly, progesterone. And that is ready for the blastocyst that has developed in the fallopian tube for those days. And also people may not appreciate that the embryo will not reach the cavity of the uterus before it is blastocyst. Uh, um, but we get away with it when we put embryos at early stage and the uterus does do the job of incubating them. IVF is different from the natural cycle and you don't need me to tell you that. Why? Because there are more than one corpus luteum being produced. Why? Because progesterone level will rise faster. It is a lot more sharper in its rise, but equally it will come down sharply too. And the use of agonists and antagonists will lead to luteal phase insufficiency that is acute. And in the second half of the cycle, the level of LH in the luteal phase will also be very low. All is there for a reason that we interfered with. And here, graphically, this is the natural smooth physiological rise of progesterone and decline by the end of the 14 days period of the luteal phase if there is no pregnancy. Look at this, that result after controlled or hyperstimulated ovaries. It is so sharp, but it comes down. That's why if we try to be clever and omitted giving progesterone on the second half of the cycle after we put the embryos back, we will not get the same result. And people had to demonstrate it themselves. You might get away with it with some, but if you don't get it, if you look at the endometrium, 63%, it will be out of phase. 52 in one study, 35, 76, 86. So it is not fit for purpose without progesterone. People tried to use HCG for luteal support versus placebo or no treatment. Whenever you give something, the ongoing pregnancy rate was higher compared with no treatment. You give progesterone versus placebo or no treatment. It is much higher when you give luteal support compared with if you have omitted it. So what progesterone preparation should be using for luteal phase support? Vaginal, intramuscular, subcutaneous, oral are generally comparable in their effect. It is so lucky and we should be grateful to the pharmaceutical industry for giving us alternative because some patients, they prefer the vaginal route. I can tell you in the United Kingdom, 85% of patients prefer and use a vaginal route. In the United States, they have a tendency to prefer injections. In France, they like everything that is suppository and so on and so forth. We have the alternative to intramuscular injection, the subcutaneous progesterone, which until recently was not available. I'm sure you ask your patient when they have the intramuscular progesterone, it is literally pain in the butt and it is deep intramuscular and it's so painful. So in order to get parenteral progesterone, there was the introduction of subcutaneous progesterone in the UK is called Lubion. And we took part in the first study before its application and it showed equivalence to intramuscular and to vaginal route. Recently, the oral route has become an option, but I may have something to say about this in a few minutes. It is our general understanding until the use of synthetic progesterone um, became available that oral route for progesterone is associated with poor bioavailability and there could be some side effects from metabolites. The vaginal route has targeted delivery and if you measure the level of progesterone in the uterus or the endometrium itself, you will find it much higher with vaginal than with other routes. But if you measure the level with intramuscular in blood, it will be higher than when you use a vaginal route. The vaginal, some preparation can be used either vaginally or rectally, which gives patient option because they get irritated, some of them are itching by vaginal roots, and you can use it rectally with the same efficacy. Generally speaking, if you give the patient a pill orally, it's simple to use. In theory, it should go through the first pass effects through the liver and the metabolite could lower the bioavailability, et cetera. And the result has been traditionally uh, uh, poor with oral micronized progesterone. 
with nitroglycerone or dofastone, whatever um, name, it seemed there are a few studies suggesting that it has similar um, uh, pregnancy rate. It is all very well to have similar pregnancy rate, but for any synthetic steroids, we just should be reminded of the fact that we used DAS or diethyl steroid decades ago only to find the effect happening later. I don't intend for a second to scare people off using um, Dovastone, but I'm just raising this as an issue. It's not just about pregnancy, it's about what might happen in future. And until we have safety data to reassure us, uh, I, I would remain uh, careful. But there is nothing wrong with the products being used in other gynecological indication, and the result as far as pregnancy is concerned are comparable. There are different truths, that there are different preparation. I'm not here to talk about preparation, just to make the point that there are the, some gel and that can be applied uh, vaginally. There are some suppositories, there are some viscerals. Some are used three times a day, some are used twice a day, some is used once a day. All the studies that have compared one against the other suggest they are equivalent. So I'm not wasting your time with this. No difference in clinical outcome. It is a little bit of just try to revisit it. Vaginal progesterone as effective as intramuscular as oral. It seemed to be true. Vaginal progesterone safer and more patient friendly. It is, it is safe and it is patient friendly judging by the acceptability studies. It is also true. Vaginal versus IM. The patient will be more satisfied with vaginal progesterone as it's easier to use and less painful and less time consuming. But there are patients who will demand intramuscular for some reason or another. It is important to cater for the needs of each one. Vaginal gel again is intramuscular progesterone. Generally speaking, they are comparable. Adding estrogen to progesterone in the lethal phase support is unnecessary extra. It doesn't add any benefit and we move on from this because it is really being demonstrated that adding estrogen does not add any benefit. It adds to the cost and add to the nausea that patients who take estrogen will tell you about. When to start progesterone? In the past, people used to use it to start it as early as day of HCG or the day uh, uh, or the day before a collection or on the day of a collection or one day after a collection. But what has been established now that it is done really, it is mainly used on the day of egg retrieval. You get the eggs out and while the patient is leaving, you tell her to start your lutel phase support from the evening, which is the most commonly used and appear to be the one that um, is compatible with what happened in um, physiological way. When to stop luteal phase support in fresh cycles for years, back in 1995, maybe until 2000, we used to, the patient get positive test, we say there is no need to give progesterone. And there are bases for that because pregnancy will not produce a, a different solution. It will only produce HCG. And HCG used to be used as luteal phase support, but be, people become wise that it causes a lot of ovarian hyperstimulation, they've been stopped. So pregnancy hormone will maintain itself. But now um, we tend to give something for patient assurance and there is consensus as being demonstrated by previous publication, um, um, Marcus and Masri produced one of those studies that about seven weeks, the first ultrasound scan should be enough. If there is heartbeat, there is no need to give more progesterone. And interestingly, this what was adopted by the National Institute for Healthcare Excellence. And here it's recommendation as far as progesterone is concerned. Offer women progesterone for luteal phase support after IVF treatment, it's not negotiable. Don't routinely offer HCG for luteal support because of the risk of ovarian hyperstimulation. Inform women undergoing IVF treatment that the evidence does not support continuing any form of retail support beyond the eight weeks or the first pregnancy scan. And here is when to start, when to stop, and most of the most common time to start is on the day of a collection in a worldwide survey. 
how long do you continue until the first pregnancies can seem to be the most popular choice. So at least the world is coming together in one aspect of luteal phase support. We discuss this and luteal phase when you are using the agonist trigger that we keep talking about it because it's a very useful and reliable safety mechanism against ovarian hyperstimulation in patients who are at high risk. But the luteal phase support, even though using GNRH agonists will work, it works magically reducing ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, but it comes at an expense. If you, that is the effect in reducing ovarian hyperstimulation, it's almost virtually eliminating. There will be cases, there are case reports, it's not totally free, but it's still less. But the cost is, the live birth rate, if you didn't add in, uh, uh, HCG, or you, when you compare it with, uh, with um, uh, using HCG for trigger, the live birth is significantly lower if you use GNRH agonist trigger. And why is that? Because the luteal phase when GNRH agonist is used to trigger ovulation is deficient. Look at all the important hormones, LH, FSH, estradiol and progesterone in the luteal phase. This is SCG in these gray um, squares. And you can see all the hormones, particularly progesterone, when you give um, HCG, there is rise of the level of progesterone and then it is sustained to do the, to complete the job. And until two weeks, and then pregnancy will look after the support. When you compare it with treptorolin or Lebron, or Lebron, which are the GNRH agonists, you find that the level of progesterone is in amplitude is low and in its level is also low. So you can see that it is not the most optimum luteal phase after GNRH agonists. That's why it is meant to be used when you have decided to freeze all. But if you wanted to get something out of the luteal phase and replace fresh, if your risk of ovarian hyperstimulation is not significant, it's been suggested that in this case, adding progesterone intramuscularly and giving estradiol and adding 1500 units of HCG could rectify the luteal phase that is otherwise would have been dysfunctional. Personally, I do not contradict myself. If I have any anxiety about ovarian hyperstimulation, I will stay completely off HCG and I will go and freeze all. But if you must, and when you give HCG, be prepared for the very same thing that you're trying to avoid happening because it's not dose dependent. Yes, it seems like small dose, but it's not dose dependent and you can still have the ovarian hyperstimulation. And more importantly, it does not fully rectify the luteal phase. Here, Peter Homaidan did a study, GNRH agonist at HCG, and here is the clinical pregnancy rate was 33% for the GNRH agonist, for HCG was 37. But look at the delivery rate. It was 24% for GNRH agonist, it was 31% for HCG. Of course, when you look at the p-value, it's not significant. Really, who cares? A, the number studied is small. A difference of 7% in the live births is significant and it's important. And the pregnancy loss was relatively higher compared with the HCG when it's added. So although GNRH Agnes plus 1,500 units of HCG luteal rescue uh, significantly decreases the risk of severe ovarian, this life-threatening complication can still occur in high-risk patients. The introduction or the enthusiasm about freeze-all has meant that when it is applied in patients with polycystic ovaries, it appeared to have resulted in good outcome. I have always read this paper as they are equivalent, but some people will read it as higher Fine, we can argue this later because these studies are not without biases and without flow and without protocol violation. Here is when it is used in ovulatory women, 49%, again, it's 50% fresh versus frozen. When it is used without, in women without polycystic ovaries, and this was in Vietnam, I think, yeah, 
And look at here, the result for the fresh, for the frozen was 36%, for the fresh was 35%, hardly any difference. And because of this, the need to take care of the frozen embryo transfer, because frozen embryo transfer cycle, as we discussed yesterday, are increasing. We, there are, in so many countries, there are more frozen embryo transfer than fresh. And it has super, it's overtaken the number of fresh cycle in some clinics. When in, in our center, we do about maybe 1400 um, frozen embryo transfer cycle, but that is because we do our PGD program for genetic diseases, it is all freeze all. So you, if when you add the frozen embryo transfer to the frozen embryo transfer of surplus embryos or freeze all patient in the general program, we do about 1400 um, a year. How do we transfer the embryos? We could either use natural cycle. When you use natural cycle, it comes with its progesterone from ovulation. But again, to reassure ourselves or to reassure the patient, sometimes we add progesterone. It's not totally necessary. If the patient can, and you are happy to manage the true natural cycle, fine. But if you have issue and you would like to get control with time, you can use modified natural cycle where you trigger ovulation so that you get some control. If the patient has no ovulation and you can't induce ovulation for her to do natural uh, or artificial uh, modified natural cycle, then you have to use artificial cycle either with GnRH agonist suppression or without. Comparison of the different approaches suggested that whether it is natural cycle or modified natural cycle, there is nothing to separate the two. Admittedly, not huge number of study. For the artificial uh, frozen embryo, you can use suppression of natural cycle by giving estrogen. That estrogen could be preceded by that regulation or not. The progesterone that we'll use could be no different from what you use for the um, um, fresh cycle. And here an example of the estradiol replacement protocol, where the patient from day two will start estradiol valerate, two milligrams three times a day, we use four, four times, and you bring the patient around day 12 rather than bringing her. And, um, and here I got this caption from the internet to show that, you know, you do ultrasounds here in the middle and you do Doppler totally and utterly superfluous. Nothing to gain from doing Doppler for these patients. Having the endometrial thickness, triple line if you are lucky and measuring eight or nine millimeter is all that you are looking for. Then when you have the right endometrial thickness, you can start your bridge through. When to put the embryos back, you put them in relation to the stage at which you frozen the embryo. If you frozen the embryos on day two, you give progesterone and on day three, you put the embryos. If you frozen them on day three, you put the embryos on, for, you, you start progesterone and three days on day four, you put the embryo. And if you frozen blastocyst, you start progesterone, you count five days and on day six, you put the embryos back. And then you do your pregnancy test again, depending on when you put the embryos. If you put blastocyst, after 11 days, you do the pregnancy test. There is no difference between natural cycle or artificial cycle in the ongoing pregnancy rate or on the live birth rate. When you compare down regulated versus no down regulated, the three trials suggest that really there is nothing to be gained from the Dow regulation. Our study favored Dow regulation, but we have to go with the consensus. And nowadays we do more and more of the just non dow regulated cycle. It is less expensive, less side effects. The only time we use Dow regulation, if we have a patient who's coming for a second baby, having succeeded with the Dow regulation, we don't change it. And the other group is if the patient has adenomyosis or endometriosis for whatever benefit from suppression the patient might have. All regimes are similar. Lutel phase support in a fresh cycle is not necessary after a positive pregnancy test. We dealt with that, but if it reassures you and reassure your patient, you can give it. I think that is a part to do with the luteal phase support. And in the time that I have left, I will talk about the controversies related to using progesterone in recurrent miscarriage. 
recurrent miscarriage mean different things to different countries or different organizations. Here, for the Royal College, recurrent miscarriage means three or more miscarriages. It does not specify that they have to be clinical pregnancy because the term pregnancy in the college guidelines mean pregnancy losses from time of conception until 24 weeks gestation. So it leaves it open and that's dangerous. For the Ishra, they use two or more pregnancy losses, but they um, uh, expect them to be clinical. The Americans are very clear. They use two pregnancy losses, but they have to be clinical, two or more clinical pregnancy. And that's important distinction because including biochemical pregnancy is not great. So what is the difference between two and three? If you use the definition as two, you will include large proportion of good prognosis patients. That's just by chance because 5% of the pregnant population will have two miscarriages and they are almost certain they will have natural pregnancy later or, or normal pregnancy. You potentially lead to using unnecessary intervention and gives them a label. It's likely to include higher proportion of explained miscarriage. That's to do sporadic aneuploidy. But if you use three miscarriages, you will be sitting on some modifiable miscarriages that you could have detected them earlier. May not be psychologically acceptable to patient if they had lost uh, two pregnancies and you say, no, no, the definition says three, we're not doing anything. That's just a little bit crass. May not be appropriate for very young patient because you're not expecting them to miscarry. Waiting three, for three miscarriages probably is not great. I would like to really draw your attention to this very important slide in our understanding of miscarriage. The chance of the miscarriage, the products of conception being karyotypically normal is increased with the number of miscarriages the patient has suffered. So for the patient who suffered two miscarriages or three miscarriages, the chance of karyotypical normal, a normal pregnancy is much less than someone had a normal uh, than someone who had a lot of miscarriages. Here, if a patient had six miscarriages, it is highly likely that the product of conception will be normal, which means that there is scope for unexplained or other reason for the miscarriage other than karyotypic abnormality of the product of conception. And that has a significant implication for what treatment to use. If you will um, have, turn it upside down, the miscarriage rate is here, it's increased with the number of miscarriages. And this is a description of what I have just, uh, or a graphic representation. After three or four miscarriages, in actual fact, after three miscarriages, you see that is a miscarriage with abnormal embryonic karyotypes, this black side of the slide. This one is miscarriage with normal embryonic karyotype. As you go further, like five, look at the proportion of patients with normal karyotype. If that pregnancy is with normal karyotype, perhaps something can be done, whether it is environment, whether it is other uh, agent that we are yet to discover, but at least this is a group that should be truly called unexplained and therapeutic intervention should be tried to this because it is relevant to how progesterone is being used. It has more likelihood of working if it is used in patient with high number of miscarriages as opposed to these because progesterone will not risk you patient with pregnancy that is karyotypically abnormal. We try to examine progesterone in unexplained recurrent miscarriage and Ari Komarasamy, Professor Ari Komarasamy, who is in charge of the National Center for Miscarriage in Birmingham now and when he was training with us back in 2008, we thought of doing a multi-center randomized control trial and we involved his original university, our own, and Imperial College, College where Leslie Regan and Raj Rai were running also a big um, recurrent miscarriage clinic. And after seven years of planning, exclusion, and multi-center study, yep. we, here is a study that it took us seven or eight years until it found its way to publication. And there was not much difference between those mis recurrent miscarriage patients who use progesterone 
the chance of live births was 65.8%. The ones who had placebo, they, it was 63.3. So it was only 2%. So we consider the trial that showed that progesterone has no significant effect. But later on, ARI and few other centers in the United Kingdom and outside, all the early pregnancy assessment units, they tried randomized trial of progesterone in women with bleeding in early pregnancy. And I hope I'll be able to connect, then I can get Ari to himself to explain to us this present. Thank you. We make a full screen. Yeah. Hello, I'm delighted to be able to share the PRISM study findings with you. Our clinical trial explored the effects of progesterone treatment to prevent miscarriages in women with early pregnancy bleeding. More than 4,000 patients from across 48 hospitals in the UK took part in this trial. The intervention was vaginal micronized progesterone neutrogestan, 400 milligrams taken twice daily from when the bleeding started to until 16 weeks of pregnancy. What did we find? The live birth rate in the progesterone group was 75% compared with 72% in the placebo group. We had 54 extra babies in the progesterone group. Now, we had a pre-specified hypothesis that progesterone effects may be better in women with increasing numbers of previous miscarriages. The reason is that an increasing number of previous miscarriages is linked to an increasing risk of a euploid miscarriage. It is such euploid miscarriages that could be rescued by a treatment like progesterone. Was there a subgroup effect according to the number of previous miscarriages? If there were no previous miscarriages, progesterone treatment was not associated with any increase in live births. However, in women who had one or two previous miscarriages, if they are bleeding in the current pregnancy, progesterone was associated with a 4% increase in live births. And in women with three or more previous miscarriages and current pregnancy bleeding, there was a 15% increase in live birth. No safety concerns were identified from progesterone treatment. The question is, of course, what should we do in clinical practice? Our recommendation is that if a patient with no previous miscarriages bleeds in early pregnancy, we will recommend supportive care. However, if a patient with one or more previous miscarriages bleeds in early pregnancy, we would recommend vaginal progesterone treatment with eutrogestan 400 milligrams twice daily from presentation to 16 weeks of pregnancy, in addition to supportive care. This trial was only possible because of the commitment of hundreds of research nurses across the UK and thousands of selfless women who took part in this trial. Thank you. Okay, so back again. We had to publish this reconciling approach to reconcile what happened with recurrent miscarriage without bleeding where the effect was not great and the dissection and the subgroup analysis that we did as Ari explained for the bleeding in early pregnancy. And you can see that all the people who are running early pregnancy and authorities in their field in different parts of the UK have put their name to this. And here we describe that when the number of misca previous miscarriages is high, the benefit from progesterone becomes higher. And you can see the level of um, benefit is increasing by the number of uh, previous miscarriages. The benefit was even greater for the subgroup of women with three or more previous miscarriages. Live birth rate was 72 with progesterone and 57% without or with placebo. And that what got us to recommend the use of progesterone for threatened miscarriage wherever there is a history of miscarriage. If there was no history of miscarriage, there is nothing to be gained from. And it is clear. The more no previous miscarriage, it is very further from away from significant. Here, one previous miscarriage, maybe. 
but look at when it is more or higher number of miscarriages previously. Giving progesterone with threatened miscarriage makes all the difference to the outcome. And like Ari mentioned, in the UK alone, 8,500 children would not have been born if it was not for using of progesterone. So PRISM and PROMISE trial found small but positive effect that seem to be dependent on the number of miscarriages. Patients who have five or six miscarriages, you give them progesterone blindly because it is likely that they are miscarrying euploid uh, baby. We believe that the dual risk factor for early pregnancy bleeding and history of one or more previous miscarriage will be a good reason to give progesterone. Our suggestion is to consider offering to women with vaginal bleeding and history of one or more previous miscarriage a course of treatment. 400 milligram twice a day starting at the time of presentation with vaginal bleeding. And here is a figure, 8,450 live births in calculation would be avoided in loss per year. We believe that a woman at high risk of having a miscarriage in this context may not need absolute scientific certainty to choose to have a treatment. It is not harmful, it's not expensive, and it may result in keeping their pregnancy. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for bearing with us with that bit of technical stop or my probably um, spaced out mind. Measuring progesterone in late follicular phase is questionable. And I hope people will think of the consequences of that measurement and the variability of the assay. Progesterone in a recurrent miscarriage has a potential for benefiting patients when they had large number of clinical miscarriage. Progesterone in threatened miscarriage has the potential of helping people with history, uh, or in, uh, with history of recurrent miscarriage. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry, till Dr. Gamal uh, comes back, I, I have a few uh, questions. So just your practice and guys in St. Thomas, you don't measure serum progesterone on the day of HCG. We don't. You don't do it in a routine way. No. What about patients with recurrent implantation failure? Would that make you change your policy? Think really? of measuring progesterone? No? I, I can't see the relevance. You don't, no. you don't. Um, for luteal phase support with uh, subcutaneous injections, uh, we have it available now in Egypt by IPSA, the Prolutex, yeah. but we have an issue with, the, with our BMI. The BMI of our patients is, I think, much higher than European uh, women. So what do you think about the dosage if we're going to stick only to, uh, to a subcutaneous uh, progesterone? Because our experience was that many of them had breakthrough bleeding, so we added, in addition to the subcutaneous injection, oral. So, and then you lose the actual, I mean, idea of just giving subcutaneous injections. What, what do you think of that? I think it is very good practice to, be, to pay attention to patient BMI. And if you give her more progesterone than less, it is better. For the reason that I've just mentioned, it's not terribly expensive. It's not harmful, it doesn't have side effect, and it's good to pay attention okay. to the individuality of the patient. If the patient has normal BMI, one subcut progesterone injection, as we have done in the original study, it is more than adequate. It's equivalent to two vaginal suppositories or one intramuscular injection. But we sometimes give patient extra progesterone depending on their BMI as you do. Okay, excellent. And the issue of when to stop the luteal phase support. It's yeah. obvious that from the evidence, it's enough till seven yeah. or eight weeks. Yeah. But actu the actual practice, and especially in Egypt, it's that yeah. nobody stops. I'm talking about fresh cycles. Yeah. Nobody stops until 12 weeks. What do you think about that? It's really exhausting for the patient to keep taking those suppositories with all the, you know, the side effects of progesterone. What do you think about that? You, one has to be pragmatic. Mm -hmm. When you compare this practice with the outrageous practice in other areas, I'm happy to accept that. Because as okay. I say, <laughs> progesterone is not heparin. It is justified at least for reassurance. Yes, it's not expensive. I will not be too dogmatic about it. But if it was something expensive, invasive, or harmful, I will not, I will not endorse it. Okay. But in cryoembryos, you said we have to give it till 12 weeks. It is the conventional is the wisdom. Explanation? The, the placenta is supposed really not to gain its full function before 12 weeks. It is a conservative estimate because you could stop it earlier, maybe day, uh, week 10 or week 11. But in this context, okay. it makes sense to continue with it until 12 weeks. 
Yeah, there is, there is an element of proportionality of what we are recommending they continue with. Yeah. Okay. I don't know, Dr. Gamal, is he with us? Can we uh, unmute Professor Gamal? Is he there or not? We have a few questions from the, uh, from the audience. I will, um, I will start with these questions. Uh, so um, the first question uh, was about, um, we have a lot of questions now. <laughs> okay, I'm starting here. We can take some of them now and we can do yes, it okay. after you finish your talk. Okay, so we have a question from the Egyptian IVF Center, Dr. Yahya Amin. A lot of patients bleed one week uh, before the pregnancy test. Do you have any explanation for that and how to react to this? We, we really don't and it is hard to explain. It is an egg and chicken issue, whether just failure of the embryo to establish any relationship with the endometrium part or contributed to this or not. When we have those examples, the only thing we do, the following time as a trial and error, we say, oh, you use vagina, let's use intramuscular this time. But it is all unfounded. It is a little bit of doing something different. Okay. Um, uh, somebody is asking about a cutoff value of progesterone level on the day of ET or frozen, um, uh, frozen embryos. Uh, considering a good endometrium, should we, should we be measuring progesterone in frozen embryos? We really don't measure, but I know there are some voices currently introducing this as a vogue, and it remains to be validated. Um, um, I think Elisabetta Labarta from Spain again, she is introducing measuring um, progesterone on the day of um, embryo transfer. I, I, I'm not aware really that it's been thoroughly validated to make it change practice. Okay, somebody's asking about GnRH analog in the luteal phase um, yeah. together with progesterone. There are some studies to suggest that it could help, but generally speaking, there is no need. If you have progesterone, let's go back again to the basic. What happens in, nat in nature? There is need for estrogen and progesterone. Both are on board. Let's mm -hmm. not improvise because it makes okay. life more complex and more expensive. Okay, Dr. Hazem Abdel Ghaffar from the Upper Egypt Group. Is there um, a role for the endometrial pattern with progesterone assay? For example, if we have a homogeneous endometrium and an elevated progesterone, can we freeze all? I really don't think there is any correlation between the pattern and the level. The pattern is dictated by the histology of the endometrium. And when you mm -hmm. see eco dense endometrium, there is nothing anyone can do about it. And when you freeze, you can't guarantee that next time with whatever preparation, you will not get the same. As long as you are reassuring yourself, there is no scarring, there is no infection, there is no polyp that is making it appear this way that is not being uh, discovered by proper ultrasound, there is nothing that we can do. Okay, Dr. Abu Bakr, Professor Abu Bakr Nashar is, is um, I think it's a comment in recurrent miscarriage, we should start progesterone early in the luteal phase because start after positive pregnancy test is of no value. What do you think of that? We never start after the positive pregnancy test of progesterone. You start progesterone from the day of egg collection. Uh, I think he's talking about recurrent uh, miscarriage in cases with recurrent miscarriage, not well, any How would you know? You, how would you know the patient is pregnant? It's just a little bit um, uh, of um, oversimplification. There is a study from India that recommended that, but really it is not the most or the best designed study. It would be difficult to know when to start, which day of course, or... Of course, of course, because you are giving yeah. the patient every month, like the contraceptive pair, we're giving her progesterone in anticipation of pregnancy. Yes, yes. And also uh, for, good me for good measures, like I say, for the first three or four miscarriages, they are almost certain related to sporadic aneuploidy, where progesterone will make no difference. Exactly. Uh, another question is about the dose of progesterone. Uh, is it fixed or is it changed in, uh, in different situations? I guess he's asking in recurrent miscarriage. I'm not sure. I think he means it's, it's recurrent, recurrent miscarriage. miscarriage. The same dose, 800 milligram. But currently, recurrent miscarriage per se is not an indication to give progesterone. But if there is bleeding with the background history, recurrent miscarriage it should be. And it's 800 milligram. 
Okay. Uh, Professor Mohammed Ihab from Cairo University is asking if we can extend the progesterone till 34, 36 weeks in patients with history of preterm labor. Uh, I that guess- That is not my area, that is yours. We will discuss this in my, uh, in my, uh, 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 Dr. Hassam Zaki is asking about progesterone resistance in endometriotic patients. Um, I think, um, uh, I think also in luteal phase support, I guess he means in luteal phase support. Uh, personally, I have to confess, I've never in my life heard of progesterone resistance. In okay. endometriosis or no endometriosis, I bleed ignorant, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, another question that you described the dual risk of bleeding in early pregnancy plus history of at least one prior miscarriage. What about a woman with, um, with a history of prior miscarriage but no bleeding in the current pregnancy? Is she a candidate for progesterone? With bleeding or without bleeding? She is not bleeding. She's but not she has bleeding, recurrent, she miscarriage. Has... recurrent yes. miscarriage. According to yes. Bromish study, what, it, what can be gained is so little. So much so that it was only 2%, which was not statistically significant. But one accept that patient with recurrent miscarriage will need anything to reassure her. If it takes you to give her progesterone to reassure her, considering again, it's not expensive, it's not harmful, please do. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a question in natural cycle yeah. uh, during the evaluation of a case of infertility and you are measuring the serum progesterone in the mid luteal phase to evaluate ovulation. Uh, what of time of the day do you recommend to measure? Because you were talking about the difference in serum progesterone in the, in the time of the day. I couldn't give an answer because I don't have experience. We don't measure it, period. Yeah, we use, we use other methods to detect ovulation. Okay. Oh, for, for ovulation, no, for ovulation detection, the patient yes. will buy from the chemist, from any pharmacy, will buy LH detection kit. And because yes. they use it as a method of contraception before even trying um, for a pregnancy, they have no difficulty. So they will mm -hmm. phone you saying the test is positive today for ovulation, which is LH surge. We will schedule mm -hmm. the embryo transfer for seven days later. If she phoned on Saturday, she will have her embryo transfer of a blastocyst on Friday next week. Okay. I want to ask you about this LH kit because we have had experience with it at the Egyptian IVF Center and they are all unreliable. What do you think about that? Like any, like any method, there is use failure and there is method failure. In mm. our society in the UK, it is fine. And those whom we feel that they are not confident in using it, we will bring them for the modified natural cycle where mm -hmm. we, uh, we scan them on day 10 or 11. When we find follicle size 17 or 18 millimeter and the endometrium is fine, we will give them HCG and schedule embryo transfer seven days later. Hmm. Okay, a, a question about triggering with GnRH agonist. I think they mean in patients for, yeah. uh, with OHSS and antagonist protocols. Is it better to give estrogen and progesterone or just freeze all and do embryo transfer later on? It is really a considered judgment. If you have eight or nine plus OSS and you wanted to give estrogen and progesterone and try, you will get some proportion of them pregnant. But the chance will be less than if you replace it in a frozen cycle. But if you have good number of embryos, there is no harm. The only downside to this, if you give them the chance of pregnancy, they could end up with severe late ovarian hyperstimulation despite GnRH agonist trigger. So it's because counter- they Because they got pregnant. Because they got pregnant. So if you're okay. concerned about, don't replace in the fridge cycle. But if we're talking about the pregnancy rate, and I don't want the pregnancy rate to, to lo be lowered because I did the yeah. GnRH agonist yeah. trigger, yeah. If, I, if I wait for day, till day five transfer, don't you think the endometrium will be ready and will no, be- No, it is, it is effective because all the hormones that are important for the integrity of luteal support are muted. So you think that any patient who receives a trigger with GnRH agonist should have a freeze-all uh, policy? Otherwise, if you will be taking risk by giving her 1,500 units of HCG to rectify the luteal phase, because it, it, it brings back some risk of hyperstimulation. And if she gets mm -hmm. pregnant, the HCG of pregnancy could trigger over. If you are concerned about hyperstimulation, freeze-all and put them. We do not have a single case of ovarian hyperstimulation in the PGD program. Why? Because everybody is having all freeze. Course. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I think we have uh, we have presented most of the questions. 
And if we still have some, we can continue. Okay, after you, you, you give your uh, presentation. Yes, sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Yaqub, for an excellent presentation.